So this week, though, I, we're going we're gonna to move forward. I'm actually feeling a little bit eager, okay? So we're not actually just going to do one parable. We're not going to do two parables. We're going to do three parables today, okay? You think we can do that? All right, you're up for the challenge. Uh, let me pray and just ask God to open our eyes and, and our ears and our hearts to him as we uh, dive into these stories of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you for this day, and we thank you for your word, which is, um, it's alive, it's active, it it ministers to us, and you speak to us through it. And so today, God, we want to ask that you would help us to hear your voice through your word. Help us to to be like those who were there with Jesus 2,000 years ago, listening to these stories. And I pray that our hearts would be open and receptive to receive from you whatever it is you want to say. And Lord, may it result in transformation of our lives, not just information in our brains. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Just a little bit of context to these parables we're going to read today. Uh, The the parables are all kind of in a row in Luke chapter 15. Um, But the context, if we look a little bit earlier in the uh, chapter, is this. It says in verse 1, Now the tax collectors and sinners... We're all gathering around to hear Jesus. So tax collectors and sinners. That's who's hanging out with Jesus. And, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they muttered, it says, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So that's what's going on. And one of the interesting things that we see before we actually read the parable um, throughout the life of Jesus, is it's interesting to see who Jesus spent time with. Yes, he spent time with his disciples, t- invested in them. Yes, he spent time with his heavenly Father in prayer. Um, but he also spent a good, time of, uh, a good deal of time eating with, um, spending time with, sharing with, investing in people who were very, in fact, totally different than him. People who didn't have a faith in or a relationship with God. Jesus would hang out with people like this. And it wasn't just good people who were irreligious. You know, you know good people that are like, hey, they're pretty moral, they do good things, they're generous, they're nice, but they don't know Jesus. No, Jesus hung out with people that were the worst of the worst, um, the most despised and avoided in society. As you think about that, you might want to think about who Jesus might have spent time with who lives in your neighborhood or who works at your workplace. Like, who is that person that lives in your neighborhood that everyone's like, man, I wish that person didn't live in my neighborhood? Uh, Or who's that person at your workplace? You're like, man, I wish that person didn't work here. Um, Jesus would spend time with that person. Um, And you might, you know, how does that make you feel? Would you be good with that if Jesus showed up at work and he's like, Hey, I love you, yeah, but I actually want to spend time with that person that no one else wants to. Would you be good with that? Would you be okay with that? Well, or would you be asking, Jesus, you're so different than that person. Uh, why are you doing that? You don't belong with them. You're not like that. Because that's how the religious leaders of Jesus' day reacted to him when he hung out with people that were tax collectors and sinners. And the purpose of these parables that we're going to read today is to answer the why question. Why did Jesus hang out with people like this? Okay? So here we are, Luke chapter 15, verse 3. Um, it's, a, it's a fair number of verses here, but I want to read them for us. And let's, uh, let's enter into the story and imagine ourselves here listening. Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or, suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. 
In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son together uh, got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his, to, to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Those are great stories, aren't they? Your brother was lost, but now he's found. So these are known as the parables of lostness. Parables of lostness. Now, obviously, no one likes to be lost. I'm sure we've all had times in our lives where we've been lost. And that, just that feeling of, uh-oh, where am I? What am I going to do? Uh, that's not a fun feeling. Um, but the harsh truth of life is that from day one of our lives, we are, in a sense, lost. Each and every person on this earth. Now, honestly, I don't like the word lost. I don't like uh, thinking about being lost or that people, there are people who are lost today. But it's a word that these parables use to describe us when we live apart from our shepherd, when we live apart from our heavenly father. And the religious teachers of Jesus' day, they would have agreed. To them, people like tax collectors and sinners were considered spiritually lost. They were living apart from God. And not just the really sinful people, but everyone who lived their lives without faith in the living God. The religious teachers would agree they are lost, those people. But their understanding of who God is and what God was doing was so different from that of Jesus. And unfortunately, just like those religious leaders back in Jesus' day, so many people today in Norway and all around the world, they don't understand God's attitude towards them towards them, the people who have made some bad choices in life, to those who don't have it all together, to those who struggle in various ways, to those who feel unworthy and unwanted, who have been rejected and despised, and to those who sin. 
You know what a lot of people actually believe today? They believe that God is angry at them, that God has given up on them, that they're unwanted by God, and therefore that there's no hope for them. This was basically the attitude of the Pharisees and the religious leaders regarding the lost. God doesn't want them. They're gone. They're lost. And so it's no wonder that they would complain that Jesus would spend time with those kind of people, right? Because what's the point? They're lost. They're hopeless. They're gone. Don't spend time with them. But the truth is, and what, what needs to be said out loud in our world and shown in action to everyone in, in this lost country and lost countries around the world is that God misses the lost. God misses them. God doesn't just, he doesn't hate the lost. He misses them. He misses those who have strayed away. He misses those who have hidden from him. He misses those who have rejected him and turned their back on him. He doesn't hate us when we're lost. He loves us. He loves us like a shepherd who has lost one of his 100 sheep. Tell me, what kind of shepherd would go and search for one of 100 sheep? Only one that loves the entire flock. Only one that loves that sheep. What kind of shepherd would carry a 100-pound sheep, however heavy they are, you know, um, home joyfully on their shoulders? Who would do that? Only one that truly loves the sheep. That dumb, wandering sheep, right? Because if he didn't really love the sheep, at best, you might, at best you might hire someone else to go look for it. I, it would be nice to have that sheep back. Maybe I'll hire someone else to go. Maybe you do that, right? But that's not what God's heart is like. God loves each and every person in our world, and he misses us when we wander away. He loves us. And not only that, but to God, for some reason, we are incredibly valuable to him. He values us, doesn't he? Like the second parable shows. Uh, now, God isn't a man or a woman. God is spirit. But here in this parable, we see the picture of a woman um, it, it, that represents God's heart. We see this picture of a woman who has ten coins. That's all she has. Ten. That's not very much. So every coin counts. Each coin is about the equivalent of one day's wage. She's not a wealthy woman. right? What would you do if all of a sudden you lost a tenth of your wealth? A tenth of everything you have. What would you do? Right? Um, if you're very wealthy or well off in, in some capacity, a tenth would be a large amount of money. But if you had a lot, it wouldn't be as significant to your overall life as someone who had very, very little. A tenth when you have very little is a lot. That's a game changer for life. And Jesus is teaching us something here about the heart of the Father. Jesus says, doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds us? What does that show us? It shows us that God values us. And that even when we're lost, our value to him doesn't change. And if those aren't clear enough pictures of his heart towards lost people for how he misses and values them, then the parable of the lost son should do it. Easily one of the most powerful, meaningful, memorable stories that Jesus told. Very, very popular one. There's so much to the story. But the one thing we have got to see, that we've got to see in this, is the heart of God. The heart of our Heavenly Father. It's a picture of what God's heart is like for those who turn toward Him. After they've turned from Him. <laughs> like the son in the story who demands his inheritance, moves away and wastes all of his money he ends up starving and living on the streets. And at that point of the parable, at verse 16, you know what the religious leaders would have been thinking? That that should have been the end of the parable. When, when, when he's off living out, out away from the family, away from the community, uh, hopeless, no income, the religious leaders would have been like, yep, that's, that's where it should end, right there. But that's not. You know, because in, in that culture, if, if a son did that in the family, the son would be cut off from the community. They've gotten what they deserve. But Jesus doesn't end the parable there. 
Because finally, at rock bottom in life, feeling just worthless, the son decides, I'm going to head home. Even if my father doesn't accept me as a full son, even if he just makes me a servant, that's at best. That's best case scenario. He'll take me as a servant. It'll be better than what I'm doing now. So I'm going to go try. And so what does the father do? It says that while his son was still a ways away, it's like the father was just sitting on the porch waiting for him looking out in the distance. His father sees him coming and filled with love and compassion. He runs to his son, embraces him, kisses him. He missed his son so much. That's our father in heaven. God loves the lost. He has compassion for his children who have left him. His heart breaks for them, for those who are separated from him, for those who have turned their backs on him and made all sorts of bad decisions in life. For those who have gone their own way, rebelled against him, and tried to live life without him. So Jesus, why would you hang out with tax collectors and sinners like that? Why would you do that? Why would you have a meal with that person down the street that no one can stand? The one who does everything wrong, who sins in so many ways. Why would you, Jesus, hang out with someone like that? Because God misses them. He loves and he values them. Let me ask you this. Do you know... Do you know how much God loves you? Do you know how much God values you? Do you know how much he misses us when we turn our back and try to live life our own way? What Jesus is telling us through these parables is that whether we're a sheep who've strayed from the flock or if we're like a coin that's just been lost or whether we're a child that's run away from the father, Jesus wants us to know that our Heavenly Father, who created us, He misses us. He wants us to know that His heart is for us, and that His arms are open wide to receive you back into the family. Personally, when I, when I think about how Jesus spent His time, you know, if I was one of His disciples, I'd probably be pretty selfish for His time. I'd want all of it, right? But when I think about um, the heart of God and how He welcomed back those who wandered away, it makes me think about my own heart for the lost. Do I have the sort of compassion and heart that God, our Heavenly Father, has for those who have turned away from Him? Or is there any apathy in my heart? Is there any kind of um, selfishness or negative attitude towards those who have turned away from the Lord? And it, it makes me want to pray and ask God that he would change that in me. That's one of the things I hope we would take away from this is, is see ourselves in the story and be like, hey, am I like that, the, the other son? Am I, you know, we want, always want to see who am I in the story? Am I that other son? He's thinking, hey, God, why are you letting that person back in? I've been here all along. I'm, why aren't you giving me the attention? Why don't you throw a party for me? Or do we see ourselves in some other way? Jesus, why are you hanging out with tax collectors and sinners, they asked. And he answered in the parables, because their heavenly father misses them. And his heart, his heart doesn't just stay as feelings or emotions, it leads to action, doesn't it? That's, that's what this resulted in, in a significant mission, and it was abundantly clear to Jesus. What was the mission of Jesus? Search and rescue. Search and rescue. You know that slogan? You know, search and rescue, seek and find. This is what Jesus was all about. This was God's highest priority, searching for and seeking and rescuing the lost. The action of the shepherd in the first parable, what was his mission? He wasn't just sad and feeling compassion for the sheep that was gone. No, he got up and he went, seek and find, search and rescue. He leaves the 99. I'm sure he left them with someone that could take care of the 99. But he got out there and he did something about it. There's lots of risk involved there. But all the other priorities go away to find that one lost one. How far does he walk? We don't know. But what's on his mind? What's his end goal? It's, it's getting that sheep back. What's the mission of that second parable of that woman? Got to find that coin. I'm not just going to sit on the chair and think about it or miss it. I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to get some action. I'm going to go. There's some intentionality and persistence I'm not going to stop until I get that coin back. The father in the third parable, what's his action? He runs towards his son. 
when he sees him in the distance and he notices that his son has turned back, he runs towards him. In that culture, a father would never, ever do that to his son, especially one that deserted him. And Jesus, Jesus, he came on a mission too. And what was it? Pretty, he sums it up in a couple chapters later, actually, very clearly. Luke 19.10, he says this. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus, why were you born? To seek and save the lost. Jesus, why are you hanging out with tax, tax collectors? Because my Father misses them and desperately wants them back. You know, when we read parables like this, we do want to stop and say, who am I in this parable? Who am I in this story? And we see God represented by the shepherd. We see God represented by the woman who lost her coin and God represented by the father. Who are you? Who am I? Maybe today you kind of think and say, man, I've been kind of living like that lost sheep. I've been away from the fold and I'm kind of off doing my own thing. Maybe you feel like that, a, a coin. Coins don't have feelings, but maybe you feel like, you know, I'm, I'm separated and I, I feel distant from God. Maybe you feel like that son and you realize, you know what, I've been kind of living in rebellion, kind of doing my own thing, kind of run away from home from God a little bit. And if that's you, I hope you hear today that God really, really loves you still. And he misses you. And his heart is for you and he wants you back. So much so that he sent his one and only son to save you. And do you know that all it takes is, that, is the steps of that lost son. He models for us what we do when we find ourselves uh, apart from God and separated from God. He models it. He, he recognizes humbly in his heart what he's done. He recognizes his rebellion. He confesses it. And he asks forgiveness and relationship. And that's, that's all it takes. And when we do that, we know, we have, can have confidence that the Father's forgiveness comes immediately and completely. He wraps his arms around us. Our hearts are cleansed. We're given new life. It's such an important, uh, incredible gift. But then guess what happens? What happens when a lost sheep is found and when a coin is found and when a son comes home? What do the parables show us? What happens? Huh? Something we all love to do? Celebrate. Celebrate. There's a party. Isn't there? There's a party in heaven. I love that these, this part of the parables are included here. Uh, in verse 7, it says, There will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Amazing. Verse 10, There is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And in verse 23, the Father says, Let's have a feast and celebrate. I love feasts. You guys like feasts? Yeah. Great, great party, right? For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. I just love that those are included in these parables. Because it's so true that what we party about shows what we value. And what's important to us. And what our priorities are. And heaven parties and God parties because his priority is getting his lost children back. He parties and he puts on a huge feast when people realize that they are lost without God and when they go back to him. So, if you aren't in a relationship with the Lord, guess what? A party awaits you. A party in heaven. And your friends will party with you too. Heaven will rejoice like crazy when you put your faith in Jesus and you turn from your sin and return to the Father. And for those of us who have already and we have returned home, I hope we see that there is no greater cause on earth. There's no greater purpose on earth than the cause of Christ. This mission that he came for of bringing back others into the family of God. Nothing more important than that. You know that's the only reason Jesus hasn't come back yet? You ever wonder about that? Why hasn't Jesus returned yet and said everything right? And, you know, Revelation 20 hasn't happened yet. Why not? Because Jesus is, is waiting. The Father is waiting patiently for more and more people to come back into his kingdom. And he's left us on this mission. This is the reason that we're still here. This is the mission. This is why God has you in Stavanger. This is, am I saying the name right? Pretty good? All right. Uh, for everyone out of here, it's Stavanger. So um, Stavanger, it's, this is why God has you here. You think you're here to, for a job or education or for, for, to raise your family or whatever it is. No, God has you here for a mission. It's to seek and save the lost, to reach 
this region, reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus. That's why he has you here. And so there's no greater cause than that. And it's so important for us to think about, well, who are those people God has put in our lives, in our neighborhood, in our workplace, in our school, wherever we are, who are those that are apart from God? To think about them and to say, huh, God, would you help me to help that person come back into the family? And it's important to think about because of this simple reason, that God's heart breaks for them. It's important to think about because his priority is getting those people back. And it's important thinking about because we know that a party breaks out in heaven when they do. That's what these parables are all about. When I was uh, in seminary studying, and I, I grew up not really thinking that I was an evangelist by any means. Maybe that's one of the reasons we, we use that excuse. I'm not an evangelist. God hasn't given me that gift. But, but in seminary, I took a class on evangelism, and what our professor had us do for that semester, one of our, um, our, our assignments was to be intentionally praying about and having conversations with three different people that we know in our lives um, who don't know Jesus. And we were supposed to journal about it every week, journal about the conversations we were having, journal about our prayers for them. And he said at the beginning of our semester, he says, listen, every semester we do this assignment, people are shocked by the amount of people that come into a relationship with God through it. And so I was a little skeptical, but I, hey, I wanted good grades, so I did the assignment. <laughs> and I began to pray for three people, my hairdresser, Okay, that was one. Um, uh, my, uh, our, one of my neighbors, or our landlord, I'm sorry, who we owned the home that we were staying in, and, uh, and for my sister. And my sister had wandered away from God when she was 16, um, and, uh, and she was 30 at this point and not living for Jesus. And, uh, and she was living with us, with uh, Tessa and I, and, and, um, and so we shared a home together. So I began to pray for and have intentional conversations with those three people. And I want to tell you that um, a few months later, after having, just being super intentional in conversations and prayers, that my sister, one day, she came with us to church. And after church, we went home and had lunch. And she looked over us and said, guys, I'm ready. I'm ready to come home to the Father. I'm ready to turn back to Jesus. And I was just overjoyed. And we celebrated and partied. And, uh, you know, it was just over, just over um, six years ago now that she passed away of cancer. And, but I know that she's in heaven right now with Jesus in a far better place than here on earth. And it's because of that semester I was really intentional about and praying for her and seeking, trying to seek her or uh, uh, trying to help her to find Jesus again. Isn't that amazing? You know, we, we've got to realize we don't know how long people's lives are on this earth, and so there's no time to lose. And so one of the takeaways that I'd hope we see uh, this week and just maybe be intentional about over these coming, these coming days is, is to think about who are three people that God has put in your life that are far from him right now, that are desperately in need of, of a relationship with God. Would you, this week, start praying regularly for those people? Would you seek to be intentional in your conversation with them? And, uh, and let's see what God does. Because it's, it's God who changes people's hearts, but he uses us and our mouths to be the ones who share the good news. And so we, leave, we do our part. We leave the results to God. But uh, I, I believe that God is going to do some amazing things in Norway as, as the church in Norway owns this, the heart of God, and, and says, yeah, we're going to partner with God in his mission. Amen? Let me pray for us that God would help us to do that. Lord, we do want to thank you for your heart for us. We didn't choose you. You chose us. And while we were still sinners, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to come on a search and rescue mission, to come and find us in our brokenness and our lostness and to pay the ultimate price of death in our place so that we could have relationship with you. And we know that when we put our faith in you, there was a big party in heaven. But we know that many parties still need to happen because there are many people around us, all around us and all around our world, who are still in need of relationship with you. We know that's why you have us here. And so we humbly ask that you would give us the strength and the courage and the grace that we need to live out this mission here in Stavanger or wherever we are. Um, and we pray, Lord, that you would do an amazing thing where many people would come to know you and love you and serve you. 
And, uh, and so we just want to praise you for what you are going to do. We give you all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.